World War II was a time of necessity-driven innovation. Militaries around the world made great technological innovations in record time due to the dire situation they were thrust into. This led to the development of some amazing pieces of gear and equipment, some of which would stay in use for decades to come. But that is not what we're talking about today. In this video, I want to share with you guys five pieces of gear that were not held in high regard by the US soldiers who had to use them during World War II. Now, as you guys know, this World War II equipment does not come cheap, so I want to take a moment to thank World of Tanks for sponsoring this video and supporting my channel. World of Tanks is a free-to-play game that's available on PC and has a community of over 100 million players worldwide. The game offers an impressive arsenal of over 800 real-world tanks that you can take control of with options like tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks. With all those options, there's always a new way to play. It also offers over 40 battle arenas ranging from open fields to urban areas, where you and your teammates can devise a battle plan to destroy the competition. Download World of Tanks today using the first link in the description below, and make sure to use the invite code COMBAT to help you get started. New players using the code get 7 days free premium access, 250,000 credits, and rentals of the Tiger 131, T-78, and Type 64 tank for 10 battles each. Returning members get 3 days premium access, a new camouflage, and a free 7 day rental of the Centurion Mark 5 1 RAAC tank. So don't wait, download World of Tanks today to join the community and get in the fight. Now back to the matter at hand. Now keep in mind that not all soldiers during World War II shared the same negative opinions of the pieces of gear we're going to cover today. There were millions of US soldiers serving in World War II and they were doing different jobs in different places under different conditions, so their opinions varied widely. One reason I wanted to make this video is because I have this 1945 issue of Yank Magazine that has an entire article dedicated to sharing soldiers' opinions of the gear they were issued. Keep in mind, these aren't in any particular order this isn't a ranking or a tier list, but without any further ado, let's get into five of the most hated items that US soldiers had to use during World War II. I'm gonna take some of this stuff off, it's getting hot in here. Item number one, sleeping bags. This one really surprised me when I first heard about it. I've spent plenty of nights sleeping outside on the ground with only World War II equipment. And let me tell you, these standard issue wool blankets are not as warm and comfortable as they seem. Now, when I say sleeping bags, I mean specifically the wool sleeping bag called bag comma sleeping comma wool. Very creative name, I know. There were other types of sleeping bags that were insulated with down and those were usually issued to mountain troops or troops in Arctic climates, but we're not talking about those ones specifically. These wool sleeping bags came around in 1944 and they were meant to supplement the standard wool blankets that soldiers used. They were basically a thicker wool blanket material that was sewn into the shape of a mummy sleeping bag to help seal in the heat. Sounds pretty comfortable actually and I'd venture to guess that it was. Some have even said that it's as warm as two of the normal wool blankets while taking up much less space. But many soldiers on the front lines hated them. Let me read you an excerpt from that Yank Magazine article I mentioned where soldiers are reviewing their gear. Sleeping bag. Not worth a damn except for rear area troops. This seems to be the general opinion. The men are opposed to the sleeping bag because they say they can't get out of it fast enough. Others say that if you squirm in sleep, the zipper works around to your back. Would rather have blankets. This actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. I wouldn't have thought of this concern, but I also have the luxury of not being woken up by attacking enemies in the middle of the night. If you've ever used a mummy sleeping bag, you know they can really be a pain to get out of sometimes. I myself have had plenty of close calls sleeping in those things while camping, and you have to pee in the middle of the night and it feels like an emergency if you can't get out in time. And even though that might have felt like a life or death situation at the time, not being able to get out of your sleeping bag to grab your rifle when you're under attack could actually get you killed. Item number two, gas masks. For this one, soldiers didn't necessarily hate the item itself, but they did hate carrying it. More specifically, having to carry that instead of other stuff that they wanted to be carrying. Most frontline soldiers in World War II were constantly on the move, and it wasn't uncommon for them to have to carry all of their possessions on their person at any given time. Imagine you're a US soldier fighting in Normandy during World War II, and you have to carry everything you need to keep fighting for days at a time on your person. Now imagine that your field jacket doesn't have many pockets, 
and the most storage you have is in your small haversack that you wear on your back that can only fit a couple items in it and isn't even waterproof. But you were given another bag. This one is waterproof. It can hold almost as much as your haversack and it's designed to be worn comfortably with your haversack on. The only problem is this bag is being used to carry your gas mask. Now you have to choose between carrying your gas mask, which let's be honest, you probably won't need. The enemy hasn't used gas yet and the initial invasion is over. If they were going to use gas, they would have used it by now. At least that's what you're thinking. Or getting rid of your gas mask and using the waterproof bag that it came in to store extra food, ammunition, cigarettes, stuff that you'll definitely need to keep yourself alive during the next few days of fighting. For many soldiers, that was an easy decision. Carrying around that mask was just a nuisance. And since the enemy never ended up using gas against the US during the war, the gamble those soldiers took paid off. I've heard of this being done with the M7 gas mask bag, which is this waterproof one, and the M6 lightweight gas mask bag, which isn't waterproof, but is still a really convenient size bag to carry your things in. Ditching your gas mask was probably most common after major operations like D-Day, because pretty much all troops were issued gas mask bags out of an abundance of caution. But after a couple days, most soldiers felt pretty confident that gas wouldn't be used. Now, actually carrying your gas mask did become more commonly enforced towards the end of World War II because the Allies were concerned that even though Germany didn't use gas so far, they might try using it as a final act of desperation since they knew they were likely losing the war anyway. Like most other things, whether or not you could ditch your gas mask also depended on your specific unit and how they were enforcing it. I've heard some argue that soldiers would never ditch their gas mask because the mask was serialized and they would have had to return it. I'm sure it was enforced that way in some units, but that was not the experience of 83rd Infantry veteran Clifford Snyder, who said this in an interview with the West Point Center for Oral History. I was responsible for making sure that everybody maintained all the equipment they were supposed to have, you know. I got a little notebook. I still have it. Well, gas masks were the biggest problem because where you, the compartment where you kept the gas mask, you could get about three K rations in there. And that was a little more important than a gas mask. So we'd throw them away. And at the end of the war, when I was discharged in Fort Dix, they wanted to charge me $14 a piece for three gas masks, and I blew my top. <laughs> so I didn't have to pay for them. <laughs> So yes, they did keep track of your equipment, but how much does that really matter to a 19-year-old soldier who's putting his life on the line? Item number three, the wool shirt. Now, I don't know that this was as disliked as some other items on this list because overall, it's a very practical garment. But some soldiers didn't like these shirts for one main reason. The wool used to make certain versions of the shirt was very coarse and it irritated some soldiers' necks. Now, obviously, that wouldn't make the top of a list of a frontline soldier's concerns during World War II, but it did irritate some soldiers enough that they found creative ways to keep the shirt from rubbing on their neck. Troops wearing these wool shirts can often be seen wearing makeshift necker shifts often made from nylon parachute fabric or some other material. During D-Day, tons of camouflaged nylon parachutes were used by paratroopers during the invasion, and they didn't exactly need them for anything once they landed on the ground. Not only did paratroopers often take their own parachutes and cut off strips of material to use for scarves and many other things, but non-parachute infantry would often find the parachutes and use them for their own purposes. I mean, these parachutes were everywhere. Everyone was using them for different things. Some German soldiers even cut up parachutes and made camo helmet covers out of them. Now, if I were a US soldier with an irritated neck and I walked past a parachute on the ground, you best believe I'd be cutting that thing up to make myself more comfortable. These wool shirts were issued to soldiers throughout the war and they went through some major changes during that time. Most applicable to this topic, the weave of the wool on these shirts varied widely on different models made throughout the war. I own about a dozen original World War II era wool shirts and no two seem to be the exact exact same texture. The early war shirts are a very fine weave that's super comfortable and luxurious, but the later shirts were a thicker, coarser material that was probably more warm and practical, but perhaps a bit less comfortable in some situations. I've covered this in some videos in the past and people are always commenting like, oh, this kid's just so soft. No World War II soldier would have cared about their neck getting a rash during World War II. But hey, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what the guys actually did back then. Soldiers during 
World War II wanted to be as comfortable as possible in the bad situation they were forced to be in. Number four, the M41 jacket. This jacket is so iconic, it's probably one of the first things you picture when you imagine a World War II infantryman. It certainly looks slick, and some soldiers did like it, but it definitely had a lot of drawbacks that led to it being replaced during World War II. The M41 jacket had a cotton exterior that was a light olive drab color, and a darker colored lining made of wool on the inside. The jacket stopped at the waist, which was a mistake if you ask me. Having a longer jacket is just warmer and more practical, and it seems like the army knew knew this because they made a longer version of the M41 jacket called the Arctic M41. Those were issued to soldiers in colder climates to help keep them extra warm, but I don't know why they didn't just make that the standard version of the jacket. It seems to me like even outside of super cold climates, that style of jacket would still be more practical. The jacket's light color was also sometimes a drawback. The jackets didn't blend in with the dark European foliage in the summer, which caused some soldiers to actually turn their jackets inside out so the dark wool lining would be exposed instead of the light colored exterior. To be clear, this was not meant to be a reversible jacket like some other garments during World War II. Soldiers just came up with this technique to try to blend in better with the environment they were in. And when soldiers start wearing their jackets with the wool lining that's meant to keep them worn on the outside, you know it might not be the best jacket suited for their situation. But the jacket's color still wasn't the biggest drawback of the M41 in my opinion. I think the pockets on the M41 M41 jacket are the worst part of it. I mean, they just suck all around. The jacket has two pockets on the front that have no snaps or buttons to close them. The pockets are pretty small and because of the way they're angled, things fall out of them really easily when you're on the move. In my opinion, these pockets really aren't good for much other than resting your hands in them when you're standing around. And like I mentioned, even if you can keep yourself from falling out of the pockets, you just can't fit much in there to begin with. Like I've said, soldiers often had to carry all of their possessions on their person while they were moving around and that becomes very hard to do when you can't even make use of the pockets on your jacket. Soldiers were forced to find ways around this like stuffing the pockets full of things and then cinching their cartridge belt around the top of the pockets to try to keep everything inside or just stuffing all their belongings into the top of their jacket and cinching their belt around the bottom to keep anything from falling out. That method's often called the GI gut because it makes you look like you have a big gut. All of these problems were solved or at least improved by... Man. All of these problems were solved or at least improved by the M43 jacket, that's what I have on now, that was developed in, you guessed it, 1943. This jacket was darker in color, made of a thicker material, it had four large pockets to store your belongings in, it was longer, and it had a removable liner that could be used in cold temperatures, although the jacket was most often issued without that removable liner. Here's what the Yank Magazine article we've been referencing had to say about those new jackets. Field jackets. They prefer this to the old field jacket, but say it should have a heavier lining. I'm guessing these guys were issued the jackets without that optional liner that I mentioned. Even so, it is much warmer than the old and has more pocket space for grenades and such, one man said. The M43 slowly replaced the inferior M41 jacket in the later days of the war, but even at the end of the war, some soldiers were still using the old style jackets. Item number five, leggings. Leggings, spats, gaiters, whatever you want to call them, they were an extremely iconic looking piece of gear for US soldiers of the era, but they were not well liked. The M1938 leggings were intended to be worn over a soldier's boots to keep things like rocks, dirt, mud, and even water to some extent from getting into the boots. I say boots, but at the time the army was issuing low boots called service shoes that ended at the ankle. Troops wore through boots pretty quickly and leather was in high demand during the war. It would have been extremely expensive and would have used a ton of material to try to issue every soldier a pair of leather boots that came as high up on their leg as the M1938 leggings did. The leggings were a smart way to provide the same protection that full length boots did, at least in theory, while saving costs and material. By the time World War II rolled around, this was no new concept. Canvas leggings were used late in World War I as a replacement for putties, which were wool leg wraps that served the same purpose as leggings and were somehow even more annoying to put on than canvas leggings. Now just because the leggings made great economic sense, that does not mean that soldiers liked them. The leggings took a long time to put on and take off. They often didn't provide enough protection from moisture and mud, and soldiers also complained that they would get snagged on things while they were on the move. The army was well aware of these drawbacks, so in 1940, 
1943, they came out with a new style of boot called the M43 Combat Boot. These are often called double buckle boots because of the unique buckle closures on the side. This was a nice middle ground between expensive full length boots and the leggings with service shoes combination that soldiers had been complaining about. These new boots were essentially the same as the service shoes used before, but now with built in cuffs that acted like a built in small leather legging. The buckle closures meant that these new boots could be put on and taken off much faster than the leggings they replaced. And they didn't have a bunch of exposed laces or hooks like leggings that could get stuck on things while soldiers were walking. The only problem was that even though these boots were adopted in 1943, many soldiers never even got them before the war ended. With so many troops to outfit, it takes a long time for a change like this to reach the front line. These double buckle boots showed up in Europe in the summer of 1944, and from then on they slowly replaced the previous service shoes. Here's what soldiers had to say about those double buckle combat boots in that Yank Magazine article. Combat boots. Only 40 pairs have been available for issue in this entire infantry company. The men much prefer them to leggings, which snag on fences and so on. There's much talk and laughter about Blue Star Commandos, SOS and Rear Area Troops wearing all the combat and paratrooper boots and combat jackets. So essentially, these guys welcomed the new boots as a replacement for the leggings, but they were annoyed that it was so hard for them to get their hands on them, especially because guys who weren't on the front lines, who they referred to as Blue Star Commandos, seem to be getting them really easily along with some of the other new equipment that just came out. You hear this time and time again talking to veterans. It seems like oftentimes the guys on the front line who needed stuff the most at least felt like everyone else was getting the new things before they were. I'm sure many soldiers still have a love-hate relationship with the gear they're issued in modern times. Outfitting so many troops in such a wide variety of circumstances can be incredibly difficult and it often takes many iterations and a lot of complaints before they get to a design that soldiers are happy with. I hope you guys found it interesting hearing about some of the items that US soldiers did not like having to use during World War II and hearing about some of the better items that replaced them. Which of these items on this list surprised you the most? And is there anything you expected to see on the list but didn't? I'm already working on a part two to this video, so let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Do not forget to download World of Tanks right now using that first link in the description, and I'll see you guys in the next one.